Welcome to today's webinar, Precision Timekeeping with Chipscale Atomic Clocks, brought to you by GPS World and Symmetricom. I'm Bethany Chambers from North Coast Media, publisher of GPS World, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know about today's webinar. It will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. The recording will be available two weeks from today on our website at gpsworld.com slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice in the lower left-hand corner of your console that there is a Submit button. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in queue. Many of the questions that were submitted during registration will be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of GPS World Magazine or in one of our e-newsletters. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Rick Aldrichs or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn over today's event to our moderator, GPS World Managing Editor, Tracy Cousins. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Tracy Cousins, Managing Editor of GPS World Magazine. Welcome to our webinar. Today's topic is Precision Timekeeping with Chip Scale Atomic Clocks. And our speaker is Steve Fossey, Director of Business Development for Symmetricom. And, and also from Symmetricom is Ravi Pragasam. Is mar the marketing manager at Symmetricom. And uh, first off, though, Steve has our presentation for you. And afterwards, there will be time for some Q&A. So if you have any questions, please submit them. Steve, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining uh, today's webinar. Let's get started. And uh, there's going to be a pause between slides while the new slide comes up. We want to make sure that everyone can see it. Uh, so you'll, you'll see a brief pause between each slide. Um, we're going to start with the agenda for today's webinar, and that's shown here. We're going to talk about what the Quantum SA45S Chip Scale Atomic Clock, or CSAC as we call it, what it is. That's one slide. And then we're going to dive into the questions that everyone asks. Uh, we've uh, introduced the CSAC to many, many customers around the world, and there's a set of questions that everyone seems to have, so we're going to cover those up front. We'll talk briefly about how the CSAC works, and then uh, we'll dive into applications for the CSAC, and then we'll wrap up uh, with a little bit of how you can get started using the CSAC. And uh, as was already mentioned, uh, we'll have time at the end for, uh, for your questions. So please submit them. Okay, let's start with what is uh, the CSAC. And um, the slide you're looking at here, uh, this is the classic, if you remember nothing else from today's webinar, remember this one. It describes what the CSAC is all about. It brings the accuracy and stability of an atomic clock with all the benefits of size, weight, and power. In other words, for the first time, it is possible to use a true atomic clock in portable applications. And uh, you can see from the photo uh, the size of the CSAC. It's uh, just over 16 cc's in volume, and it consumes 120 milliwatts. Um, previously, before the CSAC was introduced, the lowest power atomic clock you could get was 5 watts. Uh, that's also a Symmetricom clock, by the way. And the CSAC breaks through that barrier. It is literally 40 times less power uh, than what you could get previously on the market. So that's what makes it suitable for battery-powered applications. The other two bullets on this chart show that it has the specs you would expect uh, from a true atomic clock. Uh, the shipment accuracy you see there is uh, pretty common among atomic clocks. And the aging rate you see there is, again, something you would expect from a true uh, atomic clock. So that's what the product is all about. It brings atomic clock capabilities to portable applications. OK, uh, as promised, let's talk about the questions that everyone asks. And um, 
the first question that we get uh, a lot is, is this thing real? Uh, there are people who assume that it's still in the prototype stage and uh, that something so fantastical still needs some development. This is not the case. Uh, we have shipped literally thousands of these units at this point. Uh, when we first announced it, we were on very long lead times uh, because we were overwhelmed with demand. However, uh, lead times now are down to uh, very low numbers, as you can see uh, in the chart here. And these lead times will continue to come down uh, even further than what you see here. So yes, the product is real. Yes, you can get one uh, today. Probably the next most common question we get um, relates to how does it perform environmentally, things like shock, vibration, temperature. And uh, what you're looking at here is a diagram of the physics package inside the atomic clock. That's the, the part of the clock where the cesium uh, atoms live. And um, we just showed the physics package here so you can see the axes of symmetry. But in fact, the specs we're talking about apply to the entire clock. Um, when we announced we were at 500 Gs of shock performance, but our current spec is 1,000 Gs. And um, as we gain more experience with the clock, we would like to push that up even higher towards perhaps even 2,000 Gs. Um, we tested a bunch of these clocks pretty rigorously uh, under shock and under vibration. The results of those tests are in a white paper that you can download from the Symmetricom website and uh, the address for doing that is shown here uh, on the slide. And it's also on the next slide, too. Um, but uh, this is uh, the shock performance. It's a pretty rugged performer. Uh, and you'll see excellent results, uh, both in uh, Allen deviation uh, and in phase noise under shock. In this slide, we talk about uh, temperature and vibration. Um, Let's, let's skip to the bottom and talk vibration first. Uh, basically, the test we've used for vibration is a uh, standard test from mill standard 810. Uh, it has a 7.7 G RMS of energy uh, from 20 hertz to 1 kilohertz. And um, in our actual testing that we did, again, referring back to that white paper that we just mentioned, uh, all the units we tested actually met twice uh, that energy level. And again, those results are published in the white paper that we mentioned. The CSAC is offered in two temperature versions. Uh, option one goes from minus 10 to plus 70, and it has a temperature coefficient of po five parts in 10 to the minus 10th. Option two covers a broader range, uh, minus 40 to plus 85, uh, and the tempco is twice as wide as what it is in, uh, in option one. Um, so, uh, again, that's a little bit about um, how we perform in the environment, and you can see the results of that in this uh, white paper available on our website. Another common question that we get is, uh, can I calibrate the CSAC? Can I discipline it uh, with a one pulse per second input? And the answer is yes. Uh, the CSAC has a one PPS input. It also has a one PPS output that it provides. Uh, and you can uh, discipline the CSAC against some other standard through the one PPS input. The most common scenario is to discipline it with a GPS signal. Um, what you're looking at here is just an experiment we set up. Uh, we deliberately uh, messed up the frequency of the CSAC and then uh, disciplined it with a one PPS input from a GPS receiver. And what you can see in the graph here is that over the course of about 15 minutes, uh, the phase came back in line. And uh, the frequency uh, came back to uh, an error of parts in the 10 to the minus 13th. Um, how long this process takes depends on um, the jitter of the input 1 PPS. If your input 1 PPS has a lot of jitter, you'll have to set a longer time constant in the CSAC, which you can program and uh, you'll end up uh, taking longer to do the disciplining process. And that's all described in our uh, user's guide. Another common question we get is um, licensing. 
Um, some of you may already know that the CSAC began its life as a DARPA project. Um, a couple years into the program, Symmetricom decided to commercialize the CSAC and so uh, added their own development money to the effort. Um, but it did start life as a DARPA program, and so many people assume that because of that, uh, it is ITAR controlled. This is not the case. Uh, it is uh, classified as what the code is EAR99, and what that means is it is eligible for export to most end users as no license required. And um, at this point, we've shipped these things all over the world uh, with no licensing issues. Another question we get pretty often is ROHS compliance. And um, the, uh, the question is, are you, is the CSAC ROHS compliant? Today it is not. It is five of six. And uh, without reading through all the words on this slide, uh, the reason for that is we do use uh, lead in some of the solders in our CSAC. However, uh, we have been um, shipping uh, to the EU under uh, the two exemptions that you see at the bottom uh, of the slide here. There's a, exemption 7B. There's also uh, an exemption if you are shipping in what's called Category 9 equipment. And uh, the details, again, are shown on this slide. So today we are 5 of 6 compliant. Um, what we're going to talk about now is a little bit about how the CSAC works. Uh, don't worry. We're not going to try and make you all uh, atomic physicists. But um, when we introduce this to customers, we find that most of them um, are just a little bit curious about how did we achieve such a breakthrough in power consumption. So we'll explain that uh, for you in these next couple slides. Now, um, what you're looking at here uh, is um, the inside of a, of a CSAC. When you buy the CSAC, it is hermetically sealed. So we do not advise you breaking the seal, but uh, if you uh, were to look at one before we seal it, uh, this is what the inside of it looks like. All of the clock circuitry is on a PC board that you can see here. And that silver thing that looks like a sugar cube is the physics package. That's where the, uh, the cesium is housed. And uh, in fact, um, the silver uh, shell that you're looking at there is actually magnetic shielding. And uh, if the magnetic shielding is removed, you'll see the physics package itself. If you uh, slice the physics package in half, you'll see something that looks like the cartoon on the left of the slide here. And um, you can see a light blue box. That's called the resonance cell. And uh, that's where the cesium atoms are housed. In uh, actual usage, uh, the cesium is heated up into a vapor state. And then we shine a laser light through it, and we detect how much of the laser light gets through with the photo detector at the top of the stack there. And that's um, identical to how some of our other atomic clocks work as well. So um, that, of course, is the basis for the uh, feedback loop that keeps the 10 megahertz output uh, locked to the same stability that those cesium atoms have. Again, no different than other atomic clocks we make. The difference is twofold. Um, we are able to operate this entire physics package on only 15 milliwatts, and, and there's two reasons for that. First of all, the resonance cell is very small. In some of our other clocks, uh, the resonance cell is made of glass. We actually blow glass to, to create the resonance cell. The CSAC is much too small for that approach, and the resonance cell is actually an engineered MEMS part and uh, we actually etch these things in silicon wafers and then dice them up to get our resonance cells. So uh, it's very small, and that means that you don't need much power to heat uh, the cesium inside into the vapor state. So the small size is one key differentiating factor. The other one is that this whole center stack up that you're looking at here is surrounded by a high quality vacuum that serves as a superb thermal insulator. So what happens is you spend very little energy heating up the cesium into the uh, gaseous state because it's so small, and then you spend even less energy keeping it in the gaseous state because there is nowhere for that heat to dissipate because it's surrounded by the um, very high-quality vacuum. And so by doing that, uh, we can operate this entire physics package 
on just um, 15 milliwatts of power. All the surrounding clock circuitry that you see on the right is also optimized for power consumption. Um, in fact, uh, some of the components you see there have been uh, uh, used in the cell phone industry because just like the CSAC, they worry about small size and low power consumption. Uh, so the surrounding clock circuitry takes uh, 85 to 90 milliwatts, and uh, you add a little bit for production margin. That's how we get our 120 milliwatt spec. Um, if we go to uh, the next slide, you'll see more clearly these um, pieces called the upper and lower suspension. Uh, this is sort of a, a uh, exploded view of the physics package. And the upper and lower suspensions are parts that are made of a polyimid film. And uh, we print traces on that film. Some of the traces are heater traces. The other are electrical traces for signals that need to go in or out of the uh, physics package. And so um, uh, that represents the only way that the physics package is connected uh, with the outside world. And those things were optimized for minimal thermal transfer so that we don't disturb the insulating properties um, of the uh, uh, vacuum. So in this next slide here is a photo of a physics package that has been built up. The square that you are staring at at the top of the photo is the uh, photo detector, the top of the stack up. Uh, the frame you can see is uh, made of aluminum, and that holds the upper and lower suspensions in place. And then uh, the center stack up is suspended between those suspensions. And uh, this is what it looks like just before we put the ceramic cap on top of it. And of course, that's all done in a vacuum. OK, so once we've built it up, we get ourselves a CSAC, and we end up with the specs that you see on the right of this chart. Uh, and we are comparing it to some of the other uh, atomic clocks that we make today, uh, rubidium uh, clocks. All the other ones in this chart are, are use rubidium. And you can see uh, the trade-offs between volume and uh, power. You can see that um, before the CSAC was announced, our smallest clock was uh, what we call the SA.3X series, the miniature atomic clock, just next to the CSAC there, the MAC as we call it. Uh, the CSAC is about a third of the volume uh, of the MAC. And you can see the MAC was also the low power champion until the CSAC was introduced. And the CSAC, uh, as we've mentioned, represents a big breakthrough there, 1 40th the power of uh, the MAC. There is a trade-off, though. If you look at Allen deviation, which is a measure of short-term stability, uh, you'll see that um, uh, the CSAC does not have quite as good short-term stability as some of the other clocks we make. So there is a performance trade-off that you uh, have to make in order to get this small size and low power. Bottom line, uh, all applications are different, and uh, we make a variety of atomic clocks to meet those different application needs. Um, what we're going to talk about now are the applications. and. Um, We'll talk briefly uh, about how this thing is being used, and then we'll dive into some uh, GPS specifics. So this is just a general discussion. Um, anytime you are trying to synchronize um, different elements without a direct connection, that's a time where you need a precise clock, whether it's an atomic clock or some other very accurate clock such as an OCXO. Um, another reason for using um, a highly accurate clock is if you are trying to hold precise time in the absence of GPS. But frankly, those are reasons to use any kind of atomic clock. The reason you would focus in on using the CSAC is when you have one of these application needs and you're also trying to minimize size, weight, and power, or swap, as it is called in uh, uh, the military circles. That's the reason you would want to use the chip scale atomic clock. And we'll look at a couple of applications where swap is important in uh, fulfilling the application need. Um, what you're looking at here is a, an application that actually has been uh, the most popular one for the CSAC uh, so far. Um, 
This is um, uh, what, what's called uh, reflection seismology. In uh, the uh, industry, it's called seismic. Basically, um, the people who go out and explore the world's oceans for deposits of oil or natural gas um, use a technique to determine likely locations of that. It involves laying out a grid of sensors on the bottom of the ocean, and uh, each sensor has three elements. It has a hydrophone, which measures sound in water, um, a geophone, which measures disturbance in the ground, and a very accurate clock to timestamp whenever uh, those two sensors record a reading. And uh, once the sensors are laid out in a grid, there's a boat on the surface uh, with a giant air gun, and it shoots acoustic pulses to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, when the pulse hits the bottom, most of it gets reflected back up, but some of that acoustic energy uh, goes through the bottom of the ocean, and it travels through whatever is underneath there, whether it's rock or salt or sand or maybe oil or gas. And, uh, of course, sound travels at different speeds through different materials. And so um, if you know when you launch the pulse very accurately, and if you know when you recorded the reflections from that pulse, which you can record in your sensors, um, then you can determine something about what sort of material the pulse must have traveled through. If you do this uh, approach in a full 360 around the sensors, and at different distances from the sensors, you can build up uh, literally a 3D picture of what's underneath the bottom of the ocean uh, at that point, and that tells you whether it's likely that there's any natural gas or oil there. So uh, this has been the most popular application for the CSAC so far, and the reason for that is shown on this chart. Um, basically, what was being used before in these sensors was an oven-controlled crystal oscillator, an OCXO. And it was the biggest consumer of battery power. And depending on which version they were using, it would eat from 1 to 3 watts. Well, uh, the CSAC, of course, is 120 milliwatts. So uh, they were getting anywhere from uh, you know, 8 to nearly 30 times improvement in uh, battery life. And the batteries for these sensors are quite expensive. So it was actually a huge money saver uh, in this application. At the same time, uh, the CSAC offered better performance in terms of aging. Uh, and that's important uh, because these things can stay underwater for uh, six to eight weeks at a time. And they also, the CSAC also offers better performance in temperature coefficient. That's important because these sensors get calibrated on the deck of a boat and then get dropped into very cold water where they actually do their measurement work. So it was a, a pretty ideal situation. Uh, much lower power consumption to save money on batteries and at the same time uh, better clock performance. Um, so uh, that has been our, our most common usage of the CSAC uh, so far. Uh, if we look at the aerospace defense community for a moment, there are a number of applications uh, that the CSAC has been used in. Uh, we're just going to pick out one here, uh, and that's what's known as um, IED dismounted jammers. Um, in uh, both the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, a lot of the casualties came from uh, improvised explosive devices, roadside bombs, and um, the way this was combated was to jam the detonation signals because most of the detonation was done wirelessly. So the first jammers were vehicle mounted and in Iraq where there were lots of roads that worked well. Uh, in Afghanistan these uh, jammers had to become dismounted because there weren't that many roads. Um, the dismounted jammers have to be synchronized um, because otherwise there will be self jamming. Um, and so the need was for something that was very accurate to allow for everything to stay synchronized, but at the same time very small because they were going to be carried around um, by a soldier or a Marine. And so again, the same set of trade-offs that we just looked at uh, came into play. Um, and you can see that on, uh, on this chart here. And um, once again, there's a power trade-off. Uh, there's a volume trade-off, and it kind of depends on uh, which OCXO you were looking at. There are OCXOs that are smaller than the CSAC. There are some that are bigger. Uh, and performance. 
of the CSAC, again, typically will have uh, at least an order of magnitude, maybe two, uh, better performance in aging uh, and uh, in temperature coefficient compared to most OCXOs that are used. So uh, that's why people are looking at the CSAC, because of its accuracy, but at the same time, uh, very low swap. Now, since uh, this is a GPS world audience, the next application we're going to look at relates to GPS receivers. Uh, and the next couple of slides we're going to take a look at um, are, uh, come from an experiment, a set of experiments that we did uh, with a popular military GPS receiver. I do want to emphasize it was just experiments. Uh, we don't have a, a product planned uh, yet as a result of these experiments. But I think it will be interesting uh, to give all of you some ideas on what the possibilities are. The chart you're looking at here uh, attempts to describe uh, the duality uh, that exists. At the top of the chart, uh, you can see that uh, GPS gives absolute uh, position and velocity. That's what people use it for. At the same time, it can be supplemented by an inertial nav system, INS on the chart, because that can give you updates in between the GPS fixes. And that's a good deal because you can get a short-term idea of where you are, both in position and velocity. And also, uh, it can aid, in, in military cases, it can aid in anti-jam uh, because it's, uh, it's harder to jam if you have a continuous record if, of knowing where you were and how fast you were moving. So that same duality uh, extends to uh, what we're looking at on the bottom of the chart. The other thing that GPS provides is absolute time. The GPS receiver gets absolute time from the satellites, which in turn get them from the ground stations. And that's very accurate time. We know that because we supply the clocks to those ground stations, as well as the clocks on the satellites. Um, but again, if you use a very accurate clock, like the CSAC, as your time base, uh, you get some benefits. And those are shown uh, on the left uh, in those bullets on the bottom of the chart. For example, uh, again, in a military application where you're trying to do, uh, uh, use the PY code, um, you can do a direct PY code acquisition after an extended outage. In other words, you don't have to do the course acquisition first. And the reason is, uh, you know exactly what time it is, and so you can just go directly um, to the PY code. You know what time it is because you've got a very accurate clock on board. Similarly, uh, classically, you need at least four space vehicles to solve for X, Y, Z, and time. In this case, you already know time, and so you could get by with just three space vehicles. Uh, and in a lot of uh, military cases, this is not uh, uncommon to be only able to see three space vehicles. Um, because you can do direct PY acquisition, you get better anti-jam uh, immunity uh, because um, you only have to see the signal pop out of the jamming noise briefly before you can recapture it. Now in this chart here, um, this shows another one of the experiments we did. Uh, we steered um, the CSAC with the GPS signal using the one PPS input uh, for a number of hours. And you can see uh, very good tracking here, a few nanoseconds uh, over a 20-hour period. And then we turned off the GPS signal, and we just let uh, the receiver drift uh, and use the CSAC as its time base. And you can see that. Um, after another 20 hours, nearly a day, uh, we were still under 150 nanoseconds of drift. And that's good because uh, you can do rapid reacquisition um, if your error is less than 200 nanoseconds. And you can see uh, in this particular experiment, we were well, well within uh, that margin. That leads to the idea shown here. And again, this was just an experiment. We haven't implemented this. Uh, with any military GPS receivers. But uh, the idea is, if you can rapidly reacquire uh, the signal, there's no need to keep the receiver on all the time. You can turn it off between fixes, uh, because you're confident that as soon as you turn it on, 
uh, you're going to get a, a new fix in a few seconds rather than two or three minutes. Uh, two or three minutes doesn't sound like much, but if you have people shooting at you, it's a long time. So uh, the idea here would be uh, that you could um, shut it down between fixes and turn it back on when you need a new location fix and get it within a few seconds. And that allows you to save battery power. And you can see here uh, that um, the savings that we calculated um, look pretty impressive here. You could go from uh, roughly 10 hours to nearly 60 hours on the same battery size. This leads to a, uh, a related question. Uh, it's not quite uh, on topic, but it is a related question that we get all the time uh, related to GPS. And um, we talk to a lot of people who say that their mission scenario is something like uh, we've got these uh, portable devices, whether they're radios or IED jammers or whatever, and uh, we're going to calibrate them against uh, GPS for 10 minutes, and then we've got to go. Well, the problem is um, it doesn't work that way. What you're looking at here is a chart that shows um, Allen deviation, short-term stability, of various uh, devices. And it's a log-log chart. The uh, time between measurements is on the bottom. And the Allen deviation, the short-term stability, is on the vertical axis. Um, and of course, better Allen deviation is lower because it represents smaller error. Um, the bright red line that you see is the GPS signal. Um, <clears throat> as some of you know, the GPS signal short term is uh, not so good because there's lots of uh, jitter uh, due to um, atmospheric errors and multipath and things like that. Uh, long term, of course, the GPS signal is very accurate uh, because all of those effects get averaged out. And so when you get out to 100,000 seconds, which is like a day and a quarter, uh, the GPS signal, as you can see, is deadly accurate. Um, the problem is the black line. That's the CSAC. And uh, you can see that um, the CSAC actually has better short-term stability than the GPS signal out to about 5,000 seconds, which is roughly uh, an hour and a quarter, hour 20, something like that. And so when when people tell us, well, we're going to calibrate the CSAC against GPS for 10 minutes, and then we're going to go do our mission, they're not really accomplishing anything. And um, that's a big problem, uh, because in a lot of these uh, missions, uh, they don't have the required amount of time. Because uh, the intersection of these two lines, as you can see here, is at about 5,000 seconds, an hour and a quarter. Um, but you don't get full. Uh, disciplining in just that one time constant. If you want to be truly disciplined to the GPS signal, you have to be, um, you have to wait about four to five time constants. So you're talking about, you know, five to six hours to do this. Um, and most people just don't have that kind of time before their mission has to start. So the answer is shown in the uh, pink line. Uh, this is one of our rubidium oscillators that is disciplined to GPS. And uh, because the rubidium has even better short-term stability, its intersection with uh, the GPS signal is even farther out in time. So to do this, you're talking about uh, you know, 10 to 12 hours uh, to get that done. But once it is disciplined to GPS, it has better short-term stability than the CSAC everywhere. You can see it's lower than the CSAC. And so you can calibrate a CSAC against this GPS-disciplined rubidium very quickly, a matter of minutes. And so that's the way out of the dilemma, is to use um, a rubidium that has been previously disciplined by uh, GPS. So that's just the answer to a question we get a lot uh, related to GPS. Um, this next chart shows um, uh, a product we make uh, it's called the GPS 2700. Uh, the GPS 2750 is the extended temp version of it. It's a GPS, a disciplined oscillator. In a lot of the applications that uh, we are involved in, people are using the CSAC uh, as part of a timing board that distributes accurate time to the rest of the system. Most people uh, have specific needs for their timing board, and they end up designing that themselves. 
Uh, but for people who are looking for a ready-made timing board, uh, one way to do that is to buy this product. It uses the CSAC uh, with a GPS receiver, um, and uh, it provides uh, a 1 PPS out, and it provides uh, 10 megahertz signals out. So it's another chunk of the design task that you don't have to worry about. It also provides very good performance, as you can see in the blue box here. Uh, typical holdovers of uh, a microsecond or so over a 24-hour period, assuming the temperature is reasonably well-behaved, uh, very low power consumption, um, and very fast warm-up, because the chip scale atomic clock itself warms up in about two minutes. Um, and um, because of the CSAC's capabilities and uh, uh, the algorithms that are on this timing board, uh, the accuracy relative to universal coordinated time is also very good, plus or minus 15 nanoseconds. And it's very small, as you can see in the dimensions here. So that's an option available if you don't want to design the timing board uh, yourself. All right, just a little bit about uh, getting started with the CSAC, and then we'll get to uh, questions. So um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there are two temperature ranges. One is a minus 10 to plus 70. That's what we call option one. Uh, the other one is option two, which is minus 45 to plus 85. And as you can see, it eats a little bit more power, 125 milliwatts. Both of these units are 10 megahertz uh, square wave outputs. Uh, we do make some other options to provide other frequencies. And you can see the list uh, of what we provide uh, shown on this chart. And uh, there are other frequencies uh, available. Uh, depending on uh, uh, the volume, because it does take us a fair amount of work to incorporate this into our uh, automated test system. So uh, two temp ranges and several different frequencies are available today. Uh, what you're looking at here is um, the eval board. Uh, we do provide uh, what's called a um, developer's kit, and the uh, the centerpiece of the developer's kit is this evaluation board that you're looking at here. And basically, all it does is it makes it very easy to uh, get started working with the CSAC. Um, there's a socket there for the CSAC, so you don't have to solder anything in. Uh, you plug power into the wall, and um, you uh, turn on the switch. Uh, there's a standard RS-232 interface to plug to your computer. And uh, you've got all of the buffering circuitry uh, for your outputs uh, with these uh, SMA connectors that you see on the right here. So um, if you buy the developer's kit, uh, you can plug, use this eval board and get uh, running with your chip scale atomic clock literally in a matter of minutes. So this is just uh, what's included with the developer's kit. Um, you can see the uh, eval board comes with the mounting hardware, uh, the power supply, uh, cable to hook up to your PC, and um, a CD-ROM that has the complete user's guide uh, and also sample software to control the CSAC. The user's guide lists all of the commands that you can use uh, on the CSAC. Um, and if you don't want to write your own software, there's some sample software on the CD-ROM as well. I should mention that the user's guide can also be downloaded from uh, the Symmetricom website. You don't have to buy the developer's kit to get it. So um, this is our last slide before we go to questions, and it's just a summary of, of what we talked about today. Um, the chip scale atomic clock does offer a breakthrough in size, weight, and power swap. And we looked at some of the examples here, underwater sensors for uh, seismic, um, many different uh, applications in aerospace defense. Um, IED jammers was the one we looked at, but uh, we have other examples such as military radios, and we looked uh, at GPS receivers. Um, so you get uh, high performance, just like you do in many OCXOs, uh, but you also get the low power consumption, uh, which you don't get in most OCXOs. Um, and uh, we zeroed in a little bit on GPS uh, performance, and we looked at the uh, uh, benefits that you can get, uh, faster time to sec 
time to second fix or time to subsequent fix, as it is sometimes called, uh, the need to see fewer space vehicles uh, in your view, uh, improved anti-jam, and improved battery life. Um, the CSAC, as we saw at the beginning, is fairly rugged, uh, operates over a wide temperature range, so it should be suitable uh, for many, many applications. And as we saw, uh, it's available now. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to pass it back to Tracy, and then I think we'll open it up for questions. All right. Has everybody got their questions ready, or have you submitted them already? Now's the time. Ravi, will you be moderating the questions? I will. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Thank you, uh, Steve Fossey. Um, and now we would like to give you the opportunity to ask any questions you may have. If you have a question, please submit it online by entering it into the Q&A box. Simply type your question into the dialog box and send the, uh, uh, click the Send button. So starting with the questions, uh, Steve, there are quite a few questions about CSAC and space qualification. Can you uh, answer that? OK. okay. Um, so the current uh, chip scale atomic clock is not space qualified. And um, looking out to the future, uh, I think it's unlikely that it would be fully space qualified, basically because uh, as those of you who are involved in the space industry know, uh, doing that space qualification uh, for getting fully space qualified parts on the board and then uh, going through the qual is a very expensive procedure. And uh, from what we've seen so far, the return on that investment just isn't there. Uh, one thing we are looking at, and we're actually uh, doing um, some explorations on this right now, is um, the physics package, as we saw in that one diagram, the physics package is surrounded by a shield. That shield is made of mu metal. The outer housing of the CSAC itself is also made of mu metal. Uh, I'm going to mess with the slides here and probably get into lots of trouble and just see if we can uh, show that slide again. Um, the housing that you're looking at here, um, that housing is also made of mu metal. So one of the things um, that we are uh, looking at is just beefing up the thickness of the mu metal, and we think that if by that if we do that, uh, we will get uh, enough immunity to total ionizing dose uh, to be suitable for uh, a lot of the uh, low Earth orbit applications. So that's a series of uh, investigations that we're undertaking right now. And that would be sort of a um, uh, poor man's way to, to uh, get the CSAC suitable for at least low Earth orbit applications. Thank you, Steve. So we have another question that came in about uh, the uh, stability. So question is, uh, uh, when is it better than rubidium? And I believe you may have covered that in the presentation, but if you just want to reiterate quickly uh, about when this, the accuracy and stability of the CSAC is better than the rubidium. OK. Well, I think there's. Um uh, there's probably two parts to that. Uh, let me find the slide here, and uh, we'll we'll go to that chart. Uh, let's do this. Um, so um, one measure of stability is long-term stability, which is aging. The CSAC is um, uh, similar in aging to our rubidiums uh, today. Another measure is what we call short-term stability, also known as Allen deviation. And as you can see on this chart, uh, the Allen deviation of the CSAC is not as good as our rubidiums. And what we're showing on the chart is Allen deviation at a tau of one second. Uh, but if you looked at other values of tau, 10 seconds, 100, 1,000, you'd see similar trade-offs in performance. And uh, so today, it is not as good as our rubidiums. I think uh, buried in that question, uh, Ravi might be, um, is it going to be someday? And um, uh, the answer to that is um, we don't know yet. Um, 
but uh, there are some fundamental physics limitations that you run into, and uh, some of that relates to the size of the um, resonance cell. Um, if you want to keep the power down, you need a smaller resonance cell, and that's going to limit how many, um, how much stuff, whether it's uh, cesium or rubidium, how many atoms you can hold in there and still get uh, the proper performance. And um, more atoms typically mean better performance because uh, the background noise gets better averaged out. So um, there will be some limitations uh, long term where you know you will never quite get to the performance you have in larger, uh, more power-hungry products. Okay. Thank you, Steve. A uh, somewhat related question is uh, understanding the stability over longer periods of time, say up to years, and over temperature. Okay. So um, a couple of things on that. First of all, um, the CSAC, like every other atomic clock, has a spec called temperature coefficient. What that is is a measure of what is the worst frequency shift you will see across the operating range uh, of the clock. So it's, um, it's basically your worst case scenario. And um, as we saw in ours, um, if you're minus 10 to plus 70, the worst frequency shift you will see is five parts in 10 to the minus 10. Um, and uh, you may see smaller shifts than that over smaller temperature ranges, but the effect is not always linear, so you can't necessarily count on that. And uh, every atomic clock has a tempco spec like that so that you can compare how they will perform over temperature. Uh, in terms of aging, uh, there is, um, on our data sheet, there are two specs. There is a monthly aging rate, and then there is a yearly aging rate. And you'll notice that if you take the monthly, multiply it by 12, you do not get the yearly. And the reason for that is the CSAC, like all of our uh, gas cell atomic clocks, um, the aging rate improves with time. So literally, the more you run it, the better it gets. Uh, and that goes on for a couple of years, actually, uh, uh, before it sort of uh, um, levels out to a final asymptotic value. So um, that's why you'll see two aging specs on, on the data sheet, is to account for, for that effect. Um, a third thing that a lot of people ask is, well, um, I'm going to buy this thing. I'm going to stick it in a sensor, uh, but that sensor is going to be off for long periods of time. What happens when I turn it back on? Uh, that is something we are uh, researching now, and uh, we will eventually do a white paper on, on the effects of what happens after the thing's been off for a long period of time. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, another question about acceleration. What impact does acceleration 20 or more G steady state, three to six seconds, have on the short-term stability of the clock? So um, once the acceleration stops, uh, you will see uh, no, no long-term effects, if that's the question. Um, if you look in the uh, white paper that we mentioned where we reported our results uh, from um, uh, vibration and shock, you can um, look at uh, the effective uh, G sensitivity uh, from those plots. And in fact, um, that's how most G sensitivities get calculated, is uh, people run the test and then back calculate uh, what G sensitivity the unit must have had to give those results. So uh, the CSAC is no different. You, will, you can get a G sensitivity from the actual um, vibration results, and that will tell you uh, what will happen uh, under higher levels of um, acceleration. Um, but, of course, once the acceleration stops, it goes back to its uh, steady state performance. Okay. Thank you. A uh, very timely question. Uh, regardless of sequestration, what common technology collaboration coordination across multiple platform users is in effect? Um, yeah, that's a timely question. <laughs> uh, um, so among our commercial customers, there's not a lot of collaboration going on because they all tend to compete with each other. Uh, so there, the collaboration we have seen uh, is more on the um, 
uh, government side uh, within DOD. Uh, there are uh, lots of different um, uh, agencies inside of DOD looking at uh, the chip scale atomic clock for various programs, and those results are being shared. Um, when the product was under development um, uh, in the DARPA program, uh, a lot of the actual evaluation uh, was done by uh, CERDEC, which is part of the U.S. Army, and uh, I know they have contacts within other branches of the military as well, and I think some of that is still going on today. Uh, in fact, I know it is. So there are uh, a number of informal uh, efforts like that going on uh, with people evaluating the clock and then sharing those results within other parts of uh, DOD. Okay. Um, Question about the physics package. Is there a finite lag for it? Um, so, yeah, there's um, um, on our data sheet, uh, there is a uh, MTBF spec that we quote, and uh, that is, of course, a function of the entire clock, not just uh, the physics package. Um, but uh, if you look at the formal MTBF calculation, um, the physics package is a big chunk of that MTBF calculation. Um, the CSAC is what we call a gas cell clock, um, and just as our rubidiums are, and uh, all of them have similar lifetimes. The lifetime is ultimately driven by um, the resonant element. Eventually, the resonant element drifts too far for the physics package to be able to pull it back onto the proper frequency. And that's, um, it depends on how much you're using it, uh, over what temperature ranges, et cetera. But um, a typical number is, is 15 to 20 years before um, you, you see that effect. Um, but that's important to note that it's the, it's the resonant element that causes that effect. Uh, our big um, cesium clocks that we sell to, uh, for national time standards, uh, like the 5071, these use tubes, and uh, the tubes actually use up uh, the cesium at some point, and you have to replace it with a new tube. That doesn't occur in gas cell clocks like our rubidiums or the um, CSAC. Uh, the material is always in there. It doesn't go anywhere, but eventually the resonant element just drifts too far away for it to be able to pull it back in. And as I said, a typical number is 15 to 20 years. Um, there's a question about uh, commercial application for CSAC. Uh, the, really the question is, uh, is there any commercial solution for Wi-Fi access points based on CSAC clocks? Uh, no, not today. Uh, CSAC, I think, would be uh, a little too pricey <laughs> for that, and I'm not sure you'd get enough benefit uh, from it. Um, so today there is no uh, Wi-Fi access point that uses a CSAC that, that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, the, another question we got was, uh, any further comments on holdover of the CSAC after g losing GPS? Yeah, um, holdover is one of these specs that is uh, widely misunderstood. Um, and uh, basically what people want to know is, look, I, I hook up my CSAC, I discipline it to GPS, and uh, at some point in the future, let's say two days later, GPS goes out, and uh, I want my CSAC to provide very accurate time until GPS comes back. And uh, the question is, how much am I going to drift over a specified time period? And a common time period is 24 hours. So, um, what you have to understand is, first of all, what time period are you talking about? Because 24 hours is common, but is not the only one that's used. And the second thing is you have to understand uh, the temperature environment, because temperature is the other thing that will influence your clock performance. And um, so we get asked all the time, what is your holdover spec? Uh, but if we don't know the temperature environment, and if we don't know the time that they are uh, asking about, you can't give uh, a number. And um, uh, a lot of people don't understand that. They think that every clock has a holdover spec, uh, but without those two pieces of data, you, you, you cannot give uh, uh, an answer that you can stand behind. 
Uh, as you might imagine, um, if you are in short time periods, like what's the holdover over four hours? Well, aging isn't going to be much of an issue. That's going to be mostly a question of what temperature environment are you seeing and how much is the temperature changing during those four hours. Uh, conversely, if you're talking about what's your holdover after three weeks, uh, that's mostly an aging effect. The temperature effect uh, tends to recede uh, in the background compared to the aging effect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question is about the ITAR status of CSAC. Uh, this question is, CSAC is currently ITAR free. Could this situation change in the future? Um, I would say anything can change. Um, it is unlikely, though, because um, uh, as some of the people on the line may know, the um, ITAR regulations are, uh, as of the first of the year, are being um, completely revised and generally in the direction of being more uh, inclusive rather than stricter. So I think it's very unlikely that that would happen. Um, I have several questions on uh, pricing, and you know, did, you, did you want to just give a, a general answer to those on you know, how to how can uh, the attendees get more information on pricing? Yeah, they can um, uh, contact their local Symmetricom representatives and get the pricing uh, for for where they live, uh, and uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, because it, it does vary by a little bit by geography, not much, and of course uh, with volume. Okay. Uh, the temperature coefficients that you mentioned a little back, uh, were the temperature coefficients given or the total range or per degree? No, they are the total range of the clock. That's important to remember. They are not, those temperature coefficients are not per degree. Those temperature coefficients are um, worst case that you would see if you went over the full temperature range of the clock. Okay. Um, another question was about frequency steps. Were any frequency steps observed? Uh, no. That's a good question. Um, uh, some quartz oscillators um, will exhibit uh, what's called frequency jumps and um, uh, even good Quartz OCXOs are, are subject uh, to this uh, behavior. Uh, we have not seen any of that on um, uh, the CSAC. And uh, I think it's because the, uh, the cesium atoms are preventing uh, the quartz resonator from doing anything like that. But we have not seen that at all. OK. And then there was uh, a few questions on the, the pricing again on the development board, and I assume the same answer applies, that they have to contact their local uh, similar com rep to get that information, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, and then, um, well, I, I think it's a question that you may have answered before, but let me just repeat it. Uh, do we see an application in non-defense markets such as 3G and LTE base station uh, synchronization using CSACs? Um, yes, as I mentioned um, during the presentation, so far the biggest application has been non-defense. It's been uh, for underwater oil and gas exploration. Um, we are examining the needs of um, LTE uh, base stations to see if the CSAC would be suitable as a holdover oscillator uh, for those applications. Um, the rubidium oscillators that we make today we know are suitable for that application. Uh, and uh, people have inquired about using the CSAC in that application because in uh, the LTE rollout, some of the base stations are going to get uh, a lot smaller. And there is some concern about how much power they consume as well. So that's why they're looking at CSAC. Today, it does not look like uh, the CSAC has quite the performance needed uh, to meet those needs, uh, but that's something still under investigation. Okay. And uh, the last question I have for you is about, again, comparing the CSAC to the, the cesium uh, frequency standard, the 5071. You mentioned uh, from the performance standpoint, but there are quite a few questions on the uh, how the pricing Compares, and again, I'm assuming the answers to uh, contact the local 
submitted a COM, uh, sales representative to get that data, right? Yeah, it's actually uh, it's a it's a good question, Ravi, and we we uh, we used to get it a lot when when the CSAC was very first introduced. Um, people saw that we were using cesium, and they just assumed that oh, it's the same as the Symmetricom 5071 because that uses cesium. Uh, no, that is not the case. The CSAC is a gas cell clock that uses cesium. Uh, the 5071 uses a giant cesium tube. Uh, the 5071 is used in national standards labs uh, and other very precise applications. It consumes um, 50 watts <laughs> of power. It, it is, uh, takes up a big chunk of a 19-inch rack space, and um, it has um, about four orders of magnitude better aging than the CSAC does. And it's also about uh, 40 times more expensive. Uh, than the CSAC. So they are uh, much different clocks with much different price points and performance points uh, for much different applications. Okay. Um, I believe we've uh, covered almost all of the questions uh, that came in. Okay. Tracy? Yes, are we?